to see this institutional gaslighting. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. Um, and Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful. amazing, as is William as well, he, you know, fantastic support. When I first met my now husband, I tried, I, I really guess. tried, um, but... Harry says he loves his mother country and his family. However, that's not his primary message. We know that because of the adverb just. He says, I just wish they'd both been there for me. Much like the conjunction but, just in this context minimizes that which preceded it. This way, he places emphasis on his own supposed lonely experience of not having anyone be there for him. This passage sets the tone for the rest of the interview and is in line with the overall message of the book Spare as well. That Harry is fighting a lonely but righteous fight. That's how he portrays himself, so that's how he wants people to perceive him. However, is it too late with his emotional appeals to pity? And across how many interviews, articles and now books can he repeat the same message and still expect people to find it relevant, not to mention reliable? For the majority of this analysis I'll be using transcripts, which is a more accurate way of getting to the bottom of things. There'll also be video clips as we dive deeper into the mind behind the words. I'll not only be analyzing Harry, but also Meghan in some of her previous interviews. Because as I'll show, her statements are relevant in understanding Harry's statements. If you watch until the end, I hope and think that you'll learn a lot about analyzing conversations in your own lives. Leave a comment to let us all know what you think about this sad case. Let's go for it. The interviewer Bradby says that Harry has more than just burned his bridges. Harry's response is telling. He starts with the discourse marker well, indicating that disagreement or modification is about to follow. And then he shifts from the pronoun you that Bradby introduced to they talking about his family. The question was about Harry, but Harry makes a pronoun shift and lets the interviewer know who he wants them to focus on instead, his family. He places the burden on them. Also, notice the logic. The claim is that Harry has more than burnt his bridges, a claim that Harry doesn't directly dispute. All he does is modify it with a marker well and the following words that make up the grounds to his claim, that his family show no willingness to reconcile. The warrant, how a speaker gets from grounds to claim, then becomes that because his family hasn't shown willingness to reconcile, it's understandable or even okay that he's more than burnt his bridges. In other words, Harry unintentionally suggests that he isn't actually interested in reconciliation either. And with some of the clips we'll see later on, if reconciliation is what he's always wanted, he chooses strange ways to show it. Harry says he would like to get his father back and that he would like to have his brother back. Two times he says would like. He doesn't say I want my father back, I want my brother back. In this context, would like not only points to something hypothetical, but also something unattainable. With these verb constructions, Harry himself suggests that reconciliation will never happen, or at the very least won't happen, in the foreseeable future. Here, Harry gives the classic defense that he hasn't been able to tell his own story for himself. He says, 38 years of having my story told by so many different people with intentional spin and distortion. Along with the terrible expression, my truth, the expression, my story, is a cliché that celebrities and media personalities use when they're describing events with the exact kind of intentional spin and distortion that Harry accuses media of engaging in. All documentaries and heartfelt posts on social media have a spin and only present one side of a matter, no matter how stunning and brave they are. Unlike what Harry wants us to think, hearing his story from him isn't the same as hearing the truth. For example, the Netflix documentary puts its own spin on the situation before and after the engagement. The premise of the documentary is that everything was fine in the beginning and that the media liked them. You hear that? That is the sound of hearts breaking all around the world. She's becoming a royal rock star. And then... Everything changed. However, that's inaccurate because when we go back to the engagement interview, we hear Meghan talk about negative news stories already then. And I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that 
I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense, and instead we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. What she's saying here about not reading new stories before marrying into the family is interesting, considering that she and Harry mentioned these new stories as their main motivation for leaving in the 2022 documentary, Five Years Later. I wonder what would have happened to us had we not gone out when we did to see this institutional gaslighting. But I wasn't being thrown to the wolves, I was being fed to the wolves. There are lots of indicators that Megan knew exactly what she went into, unlike what she claimed in her interview with Oprah, especially when we consider the interview she did before the couple left the UK. When I first met my now husband, my friends were really happy because I was so happy, but my British friends said to me, I'm sure he's great. You shouldn't do it, because the British tabloids will destroy your life. And I very naively, I'm American, we don't have that there. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense, I'm not in tabloids. I didn't get it. I really tried to adopt this British sensibility of a stiff upper lip. I tried, I, I guess. really tried, um, but... Given this context, her saying that she really tried might not sound entirely convincing to a lot of people. In conclusion, then, we see that Harry and Meghan intentionally put their own spin on things. This makes Harry's words, spin and distortion sound more like projection than a reliable critique of the press. What he says is also generalizing. It's convenient to blame the press. He avoids having to go into specifics, each specific news story, and thus avoids having to take the accountability that he accuses his family of avoiding. The internal stress that Harry's feeling at this point manifests itself in his language. He starts making a lot of self-repairs. Self-repairs are reformulations that often end up sounding like stammering. He repeats the pronoun I three times before he makes three staccato proclamations. I love my father, I love my brother, I love my family. I call them staccato because they sound unemotional. They sound like repetitions that he has to say in order to get to something else. And Harry does get to something else. He says that nothing of what he's done in the book or otherwise has ever been to harm them or hurt them. First of all, this simplifying claim can easily be disputed by the many unnecessary details about William and Catherine in the book. So many horrible images that a lot of us would probably wish that Harry hadn't imprinted in our minds. But it can also be disputed by scenes from the documentary. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. In this clip, Harry not only insinuates, but flat out says that some or most of the positive stories about William are lies. Or what about this clip? When someone who's marrying in, who should be a supporting, a supporting act, is then stealing the limelight or is doing the job better than the person who was born to do this. That upsets people, it shifts the balance. Here, Harry's happy to show negative headlines about William and Catherine, as long as these headlines favor him and Meghan, the press that Harry presumably has a problem with. Sure. We observe the interjection um. more and more, indicating hesitation. And in line with this, we observe the fixed expression, you know, most people say you know without thinking much about it, but in a setting like this, a high-stress situation, we take note of it. You know indicates a sudden high level of self-awareness, that the subject's very much aware of the other person in the room, the interviewer, and that this person knows that the subject's telling the truth, which of course he doesn't. The verb know points to shared knowledge. Along with the hesitation markers, Harry's language reveals significant internal stress, further evidenced by abrupt stops in a sentence like, there comes a point where, you know, going back to the relationship, and so on. Hence, we can be sure that what he's saying here is particularly sensitive to him. Also, notice the indirect formulation. He makes nothing the grammatical subject, as opposed to using the personal pronoun I as the grammatical subject, as in I didn't mean to hurt them, or something similar. There's hesitation here, most likely reluctance in expressing a full-on confrontation. 
It's more comfortable and convenient to be edgy and confrontational in a documentary or a book that you have control over than in an interview that you don't control, at least not entirely. But what does he actually say? He says that certain royal members have decided to get in bed with the devil. These are harsh words that Harry uses to emphasize his self-perceived role as protagonist. It's a very easy, unspecific and childish way of dividing people into good and bad. It sounds more like he's realized that the many opportunities the two of them have had to tell their story haven't exactly made people appreciate them more. He now has to use stronger language to get his claims across. Also, what he says here flies in the face of his claim to not wanting to harm or hurt anyone. If I were a family member, I'd certainly find a claim like this hurtful. This passage reveals how Harry views himself in relation to his family, that his feelings and his thoughts are more important than anyone else's. Harry says that he has a lot of compassion. Thanks for the reminder, in case we had any doubt. Compassion as to why certain family members are close to the tabloid press, but that there have been decisions that have been incredibly hurtful. Harry only sees how one side is being hurtful, his family. He doesn't see, doesn't want to see, or doesn't want to give the impression that he knows that if anyone has made comments that are intentionally hurtful and ridiculing, it's them. I remember in the car and driving up and he said, you know how to curtsy, right? And I just thought it was a joke. I curtsied as though I was like. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, your majesty. Also, in the Oprah interview, Meghan tried to portray herself as the bigger person in her feud with Catherine, whatever that feud was actually about. Meghan claimed that Catherine really hurt her feelings, but that she allegedly apologized and did what Meghan would do if she had done something like it. Take accountability for it. Even though accountability is the one thing we didn't hear her take throughout the whole interview. Instead, she found it unfair that she had to Google the national anthem and learn hymns and other existential problems like that. Thus, she mentions taking accountability, just as Harry mentions compassion and understanding, precisely because they know they don't take it and don't have it. Hence the need to psychoanalyze themselves in the first place, to draw the conclusions for people beforehand and guide their perception of them, something that Meghan has a history of doing. Let's listen to a small portion of an inspiring speech. They changed it from women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans to people all over America. It was at that moment that I realized the magnitude of my actions. At the age of 11, I had created my small level of impact. In the next passage, we get to the truth the real truth that we've found evidence of in bits and pieces of Harry's language. Since the beginning of this brave interview, Harry says he wants reconciliation, but then he inserts the conjunction but, which minimizes that claim and emphasizes the accountability that he wants his family to take, revealing what's more important to him. He says that you can't just continue to say that he's delusional and paranoid when all the evidence is stacked up. What evidence? What objective, irrefutable evidence is Harry referring to? Again, by generalizing like this, he takes the easy way out without having to deal with specifics. He mentions the transition period and that everyone doubles down, that his wife shares her experience and that instead of backing off, both the institution and the tabloids doubled down. I refuse to believe that Harry can't see the irony of his own statements. First of all, of course there's going to be negative attention in a transition period when two people decide to leave their senior roles. It's not an everyday occurrence. Secondly, Meghan didn't just share her experience. She made statements that amounted to accusations against the royal family, and also the press for that matter. And she did it willingly and knowingly and on TV. Of course there was going to be negative backlash. 
Harry and Meghan chose to be very public about private matters. And now that they didn't manage to persuade many or most people, Harry portrays what they did as innocuous and honest. Like I said, I refuse to believe that he doesn't know what he's doing here, because he seems very deliberate in all that he says and does. And when he brings up not wanting to harm or hurt anyone, it sounds like he knows that that's exactly what he's doing. Why else mention the words? Harry and Meghan truly want to have their cake and eat it too. The cake can taste very sweet though. The irony continues. On the one hand, Harry distances himself from the press, but on the other hand, it sounds more like he just wants equally unfair treatment. He claims that he and Meghan were scrutinized more than probably anybody else, and that he sees a lack of scrutiny to his family. So again, scrutiny is bad when it involves him, but it's good when it involves his family. But does two wrongs, in Harry's perspective, make a right? I guess so. Or maybe it's jealousy, jealousy of his brother and his wife, who, by the way, have never felt the need to broadcast private problems to the world. Just like Meghan portrayed herself as the bigger person who found it in herself to forgive Catherine, Harry turns reality on its head by claiming that he thinks there's probably a lot of people who, after watching the documentary and reading the book, will go, how could you ever forgive your family for what they've done? He then attempts to convince us into believing that people have already asked him that, thus indirectly admitting that he knows most people are going to be skeptical of that. Hence his need to mention the alleged support right away. Also, forgive what? What has the family done specifically? This attack is as vague as the documentary. He then continues to portray himself as the bigger person as he reveals what he allegedly answered them. And I said forgiveness is 100% a possibility, because I would like to get my father back, I would like to have my brother back. He makes himself sound like a role model for good and decent behavior. A small but potentially important detail is that he says said in past tense. Thus, saying this to the people who allegedly ask him about this doesn't seem to be ongoing. If it were, he would have said say, present tense. He's either referring to a one-time thing or a thing that hasn't even happened. He reuses the verb construction would like, thus unintentionally highlighting that it's either never going to happen or not going to happen in the near future. Harry keeps simplifying things, saying that the antagonist is the tabloids who want to create as much conflict as possible. He says this whilst deliberately overlooking the conflict that Meghan initially started, and that he's taken part of ever since. Again, he's accusing others of doing what he's doing. He's monopolizing certain words before the opposing side has a chance to. He also did that in the documentary to see this institutional gaslighting. The lawyer friend monopolized the word agenda, talking about other people's agendas and thus anticipating the objection that Harry and Meghan have an obvious agenda with the documentary. There was a real kind of war against Meghan and I've certainly seen evidence that there was negative briefing from the palace against Harry and Meghan to suit other people's agendas. Harry then maintains that members of his family are complicit in that conflict. Harry has an interesting definition of what it means to not hurt or harm anyone. And the interviewer takes Harry back to the point where he met the love of his life and introduced her to William and Catherine. Harry can't wait to overlap with the highly relevant observation, their Suits fans. At this point, he and Meghan have talked more about Suits than actual Suits fans, in case they exist. In any case, Harry's relevant observation is a preface to the praise he's about to give Meghan. The interviewer asks Harry if it's fair to say that they didn't get on almost from the get-go. Interestingly, Harry says, yeah, fair. This is interesting because he and Meghan gave a much different impression in the engagement interview. Have you you've met each other's families? I imagine. Yes, his family has been so welcoming, and and you've met quite a few of them, actually. I have on both sides of his family, his mom's yeah. side as well, which has been really important to me too. But um, yes, the family has been great, and over the past year and a half, we've just had really nice time getting to know them and progressively helping me feel a part of 
of not just the mm -hmm. institution, but also part of the family, which has been really, um, really special. Um, and Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful, amazing, as is William as well, he, you know, fantastic support. If they weren't being truthful in a previous interview, why believe them in a current interview? Oh, they had to say it back then because they were still part of the family. Maybe so, but the point remains. Just because they say something different today, it doesn't mean that that's the truth. Who's to say if the truth changes two weeks from now? Maybe they joined a local cloth dancing club and it's the club's fault that they had to leave the UK. Who knows at this point? Who knows what Harry and Meghan will say two weeks from now? Harry then resorts to another annoying buzzword, stereotyping, which sounds strangely similar to Meghan's meaningful podcast, Archetypes. I wonder who's been influencing him with this word. I'll let you know when I find out. He praises Meghan, saying he doesn't think they were ever expecting him to get in a relationship with someone like Meghan, who had a very successful career. That there was a lot of stereotyping happening. First of all, stereotyping are just realistic concerns. Because of Meghan's status as divorced, and because of her possible motives to start dating Harry at the tender age of 34, Harry is well aware that his family is going to have concerns, but not because they are evil but because they want what's best for him. He can't hide behind the virtue signaling word, stereotyping for that. Secondly, by claiming that she had a very successful career, it can sound like he's merely pedestalizing Meghan, praising her way too much. However, if we consider the context, the context is William and Catherine meeting Meghan. Thus, Harry has an interest in sounding superior to them, as if he exceeded their expectations by choosing Meghan. As we've seen, it's sensitive to him to that he and his brother, brother are treated the same. The it doesn't seem to matter much to him if it's fairly or unfairly, as long as it's equal. Also, the reasoning doesn't make sense. If William and Catherine had actually had this thought that Harry had outdone himself, there would be no reason to stereotype, as he says. They quote-unquote stereotyped precisely because they had expected him to find someone else someone better in their view. As a result, this all ends up sounding like Harry's self-comforting lies as to how he ended up in the situation he's in. The exact opposite of what he's claiming. The interviewer asks what Harry means by that. And at this point, who can blame the guy? Harry claims that the stereotyping was causing a bit of a barrier for them to welcome Meghan into the family. However, could Harry be intentionally confusing stereotyping, whatever this word even means, if anything, with concern? There's a lot that points to it. Notice the hitching language in this passage. Some of the way that they were acting or behaving, a bit of a barrier and sort of. Hitching is vague language indicating uncertainty rather than certainty. Harry's being as vague as the word stereotyping itself. Maybe because they weren't stereotyping at all, but were simply looking out for him. And also, consider the image that a royal family has to uphold, whether we agree with it or not. This implies that Harry's looking for someone to blame for his current situation. In her interview with The Cut, Meghan made it sound like deal-breakers that she couldn't post photos on Instagram the way she had been used to, and that she had to give up her passport. Both things are obvious, and she would have known this from the moment she started dating Harry. This is important to keep in mind, because along with the national anthem she had to Google, and the hymns she had to learn, these are things that she considers actual problems, completely of her own accord, and completely unedited. They can't blame the press or the family for complaints like that. Do these complaints sound like the royal family was the real problem? That stereotyping was the real issue? Not in my opinion. In my opinion, the words speak for themselves.